Well, good evening. So as people are entering the webinar, we'd like to thank you for taking your time out to join us this evening for our webinar about invasive plant sales in Hawaii. What you learn will shock you. So we're going to be covering some myths, and that is the theme of this year's Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. It is the Mythbusters. So we are happy to have with us today um, Chuck Chimera from the Hawaii Pacific Weed Risk Assessment, Molly Murphy, she is with Big Island Invasive Species Committee Plant Pono Program, Stephanie Easley, she is a legal fellow with the Coordinating Group on Alien Pest Species, Jonathan Ho is the Inspection and Compliance Section Chief with Department of Agriculture's Plant Quarantine Branch. I'm Erin Bishop. I'm going to be the host for tonight's webinar, and I'm with the Oahu Invasive Species Committee. And we also have Jamie Miller. She's also with OISC on our outreach team. She's going to be providing some technical support. Before we get started with the presentation, we're just going to launch a brief poll. This is um, to help us collect some demographics so we know who our audience is and where they're joining in from across the state or um, even on the continental U.S. Should only take you, it's just three questions, take about 30 seconds to do. So we'll ask you to go ahead and answer these questions before we get started. We're really looking forward to tonight's webinar. We're going to hopefully answer some of these questions for you. And if you do have questions as we go through the presentation, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A icon. That's the little app at the bottom of your screen that has the question bubbles. You can put your questions in there and about 15 minutes towards the end of the presentation, we'll take time to answer those questions. Um, you can also use the chat, but question and answer is preferred. We'd also like to remind you that we want to keep this professional and respectful. So please ask specific questions um, and refrain from making comments. But all questions are um, welcome, and we hope that we can answer those for you. As we go along, also, Jamie, our little backup technician down there, she's going to be putting in some um, links. So we'll be talking about some websites where you can find more information. She will drop those links in the chat for you. So we will go ahead and get started. All right. And everyone can see my screen. Excellent. Okay, so this is the invasive plant sales in Hawaii. We're hoping to provide you with some information and bust some myths tonight. As we get started, um, one of the myths that we start out with is that if it ships here or sold here, it is safe. And that is not actually the case. So whenever you visit some of these box stores or a nursery or a garden center or buy plants online, don't be fooled that just because you got it and it can ship here, it's safe. And we'll just give you some quick examples. Um, this example was pulled from Craigslist just a couple of days ago. Someone on Kauai is selling glory bush. While this is um, something that is invasive, known to be here in Hawaii and invasive, it's um, also on the noxious weed list as it's a tibichina plant, doesn't mean that they can't ship you seeds. So if you go to plantpono.org, you can look this plant up and you'll find that it is a high risk and it has a score of 10, which means that it has the potential to be weedy here in Hawaii. Another one that we come across um, here on eBay, we have for sale actually Chromalina odorata. This is also known as devil weed. This is also on the noxious weed list, but it's also one of these plants that's being promoted as something completely different called Mexican dreamer. Another one that we came across is Tree of Heaven. And this one is known to be invasive and pretty invasive, not just here in Hawaii, but all across the United States. And people are selling this on eBay. I went ahead and tried to buy this plant and there was no issue with it shipping to Hawaii. And another one, this has gotten a lot of popularity lately. This is Pampas Grass. 
And pampas grass is known to be invasive here in Hawaii, um, but there's a little bit of complexity to this plant and we're gonna go into that a little bit later on. But you can buy these plumes on Etsy and it will ship here to Hawaii. So the myth that it is safe doesn't really apply here. Just because you can buy it here in Hawaii doesn't mean that it doesn't have the potential to be invasive. And then lastly, this is another popular one, are raspberry and blackberry bushes. Um, one of these is actually Himalayan blackberry. It's actually a target of OIS. We're trying to eradicate it here on Oahu. It's caused a lot of problems in the Pacific Northwest, and that's where this person is selling it from out of Etsy. So you have to watch what you buy online, and we're going to talk about why some of these things can actually be shipped here to Hawaii. So the myth, just because it's safe, is busted. Oops. All right. And I have the pleasure of talking about the legal foundations for prohibiting the movement and sale of invasive plants in Hawaii. So. There is no like one definition of invasive species that applies to all federal and state laws. The one I put here on the screen is pretty commonly accepted. It's an executive order that um, has been around for a long time. It says an invasive species means with regard to a particular ecosystem, a non-native organism whose introduction causes um, or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human, animal, or plant health. So that's pretty broad. So you think, great, let's take that definition and put it in our law book and make a Hawaii invasive plant list. Oops, next slide, please. Well, you can't. Um, there is no list of plants that are invasive in Hawaii, and there's a number of reasons for that. And some that don't automatically come to mind when you think about, um, you know, regulating invasive species for conservation purposes. In the middle of this slide, you see the constitution. Um, there are provisions that protect, the, in the constitution that relate to regulating the sale and uh, a plant. There's um, due process if you, you know, people can't be deprived of their property without due process of law under the fourth and 14th amendments. They can't be subject to unreasonable searches. So any program of searching for invasive plants and taking them have to be reasonable. I also put um, the supremacy clause, that's a big one. It's the one you don't hear about that much, but it says the federal law is the law of the land and with some exceptions, state law is subordinate to federal law. So if the feds say you can't regulate it, you can't regulate it. And then I also put a little pest in one side and a little plant in the other side uh, of the slide. And that's because the history of laws regulating the movement of plants, you know, it started out regulating plants to prevent pests from impacting agricultural crops. You know, in the 1800s, there's always been laws that's regulating the movement of plants, but it was primarily to, pro to protect crops and prohibit pests from moving. It's only been more recently that concerns about biodiversity and watershed protection and endangered species and those kinds of concerns have developed in the law and restrict the movement of the plants themselves, not just because they move a pest. So on the next slide, we'll talk more about the Supremacy Clause. So in 2000, the federal government adopted the Plant Protection Act. And that says that only the federal government can restrict the importation of a noxious weed, which is basically that means the plant itself is invasive, or any item to prohibit a plant pest from moving on it. So if there's a plant in Australia that is invasive in Hawaii, but not based in the rest of the United States, that law prohibits Hawaii from saying you can't bring it in. It would have to go on the federal noxious weed list. And we're just one state out of 50, and it might be something that's desirable on the mainland, so we'd have to try to get on there. But other, we can't stop it from coming in. Movement within the states, the federal government can regulate it. Hawaii can regulate it as much as the federal government does if for certain species. And then for other species, if the federal government doesn't regulate it, Hawaii is able to do so. Then movement within the state, pretty much the federal government stays out of that and Hawaii can make its own rules. Now this is a lot of information and maybe if there's questions after, I'll try to cover them. Um, so next slide, please. So um, there is a federal noxious weed list um, and it prohibits anyone from bringing it into the United States or moving interstate. I put the definition, I don't know if you can read it there, of what a federal noxious weed is. And you can see the 
like historical importance of agriculture. It's um, something that could cause damage to crops, including nursery stock, plant pests, livestock, poultry, or other interests of agriculture, irrigation, navigation. And then at the end, you have natural resources, public health, and the environment. So if it's on that list, it can't come into Hawaii. So that's one way we prohibit it. And then the next slide. So, oops, did we go? I think we need to go back one, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, Hawaii requirements. So this is for plants moving within the United States, what Hawaii can do to prevent them from coming in. And there's three main legal mechanisms they have available. The first is um, the plant import restrictions. And this is kind of the older regulations that are intended only to prevent the movement of pests. So th they stop the movement of certain plants because those plants might have pests that impact agriculture. And the species that are regulated, that are intended to be protected are like sugarcane, pineapple, coffee, passion fruit, uh, taro, and other species. So for instance, they prohibit the importation of all grasses um, to prevent a pest of sugarcane coming in from grasses. Um, the next tool available is the restricted plant list. This was a statute that was um, enacted in 2000. It directs the Hawaii Department of Agriculture to make a list of specific plants um, that need a permit for import, or then they can restrict the sale of those plants. And it can either be because the plant itself is invasive or because it would carry a pest. Right now, there is no restricted plant list per se. It's still a tool about, out there that's available for the Hawaii Department of Agriculture to use in the future. But then in 2008, the legislature made a law that said anything that is on the Hawaii state noxious weed list um, cannot be imported into Hawaii, except in very limited circumstances for research and cannot be sold in Hawaii. Um, so, and it's also, it's kind of interesting to note here the difference the legislature and the laws have taken with respect to invasive animals and invasive plants in Hawaii. For an, an animal, any animal, you know you have it has to be on a list that's approved and you have to have a permit for it. For plants, you can bring in all plants unless it's in one of these um, relatively small groups of restricted plants. Okay, next slide, please. So then the next um, way that they, the um, invasive plants are regulated in Hawaii is movement within the state. And there's a couple of tools available for that. There's chapter 72 of the Hawaii Administrative Rules, which is the plant pest rules. And that prohibits the movement of a plant that's infested with the pest from moving around the state. Again, it doesn't stop a noxious weed from moving around. It's if the plant has a pest on it, it can't be moved into island. The next would be permit conditions. Something that we were talking about required a permit to be imported. Um, it could include conditions that um, say it can't be moved. And then the last one is the noxious weed list. So each species on the state noxious weed list, there's the species and then it designates the area that is free or reasonably free or relatively free of that plant. So you can't move a noxious weed to an area that is designated as free or relatively free of that noxious weed. Unfortunately, that list was last updated in 1992, so it doesn't fully reflect um, the current distribution of where the noxious weeds are and maybe the noxious weeds that would be the highest concern to Hawaii. And with that, I'll hand it over to Chuck to talk about noxious weeds. Thanks, that was a great uh, introduction, uh, Stephanie, and, I'm, and I always learn something every time. I think I understand, and then there's always something new that comes up. but. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about the state and federal noxious weeds, um, and uh, Stephanie kind of gave a, a, a definition of what a noxious weed is from the state. In addition to the harms it can cause to agriculture, the environment, or uh, human or animal health, uh, a noxious weed also has to meet at least one of uh, one requirement in each of the five criteria that are listed here. And I'm not going to go into those in detail, but just uh, generally how a plant reproduces, whether by seed or vegetatively, how it grows and whether it can compete with crops or, uh, you know, native ecosystems, the detrimental effects it can have in these types of places, 
uh, how difficult a species is to control and whether are there any effective means to control it. That's taken into consideration for listing a noxious weed. And then as Stephanie was mentioning, uh, the distribution of the plant, where it occurs in the islands and how widespread it is, um, also affected which uh, plants were considered for um, inclusion on the noxious weeds. Uh, next slide, please. So here, here they are in all their glory. Um, this is the Hawaii State Noxious Weeds. Um, these are all gonna be on the test, so take a moment to memorize them. As of now, there are 75 species and four genera of plants that meet the definition of and are officially designated as state noxious weeds. And these include some really notorious invasive plants like Coster's Curse or Clydemia herta. If anybody's gone hiking on a trail, you probably encountered it. Uh, fountain grass, uh, very widespread invasive grass, especially out here on the Big Island, uh, highly flammable um, pasture and subalpine weeds like gorse are on this list, as well as both widespread and some rather obscure plants. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and in addition to the those uh, state noxious weeds, we do have the federal noxious weeds as well, as Stephanie mentioned. Um, this includes 112 species or genera, and these are broadly uh, these can be broadly grouped into these uh, categories of 19 aquatic plants, five parasitic, and 88 uh, terrestrial or land plants. So, next slide, please. Okay, so now we know how many state and federal noxious weeds there actually are, and um, that's about 191 species or genera on both lists. So now let's review how many non-native plants are actually in the Hawaiian Islands that either are or could potentially become invasive plants. So to begin, there's estimated right now, or I should say there's officially reported to be 1,493 naturalized non-native plants in the Hawaiian Islands. And this is according to the online flora that's uh, hosted by the Smithsonian Institution. Naturalized refers to a non-native species that can sustain itself uh, by through self-reproducing populations for several cycles or for a given period of time without direct intervention by people or in spite of human intervention. Now, this total of naturalized plants um, actually outnumbers all known native species from native plant species from the Hawaiian Islands. That total is 1,369. Um, and that includes ones that are um, extinct. So our island flora is now more non-native than it is native. And this naturalized list is definitely an underestimate, but it does give us a, a first indication of what plants either are or could become invasive or cause problems here. Now, there's also cultivated plants in Hawaii that are not reported to be naturalized yet. And there's uh, estimates of, you know, roughly 10 to 15,000 cultivated non-native plants in the islands, many of these which are either could become naturalized and invasive or maybe already are. We just haven't detected them yet. Um, on top of that, there are many, many more plants that could be introduced for future cultivation. And according to some estimates, there are between 250,000 to 400,000 plant species worldwide. And that's a huge pool to potentially introduce a future invasive species. Um, this, this total of all plants worldwide can include rare or rarely cultivated plants, you know, about which little may be known. So even they could be invasive and we just don't know anything about them. And it can also include very notorious invasive species like the tree of heaven or Ailanthus altissima pictured here, which is um, highly invasive on the mainland, but it's not on any state or federal noxious weed list. Uh, next slide, please. So the last slide um, should give you an indication that the number of listed state and federal noxious weeds is vastly outnumbered by the pool of naturalized, cultivated, and future cultivated plants. Um, but the story isn't all bleak. For example, our, our current noxious weed list includes four entire genera of plants with a total of, you know, over 2,400 taxa and only nine species within those genera are currently known to be naturalized or invasive in the Hawaiian Islands. And three of these genera are from uh, the Melastome family of plants, which is 
um, got a lot of highly invasive species in it and it includes such notorious invaders as Myconia calvescens, uh, Coster's Curse, uh, mentioned it earlier, and, and Tibicina herbacea. And most of the species in these four genera on the state noxious weed list are currently not currently known to be invasive anywhere in the world. But because of the reputation of the other species in the genus, they're included on the noxious weed list. So in this instance, although they're not yet invasive, and some of these you know, have never even been cultivated before, their inclusion does provide some preemptive protection for Hawaii. So in other words, not all noxious weeds are currently invasive plants, at least not yet. And we hope that continues to be the case. Uh, next slide, please. So now here's a tale of two invasive grasses in the same genus, uh, Cordidaria, which includes about 20 species worldwide. Um, on the left, we have uh, Cordidaria jubata or pampas grass, an invasive species that's uh, being actively controlled on the island of Maui, and it's highly invasive in other parts of the world, um, especially California and New Zealand. And because of its reputation in those places, Cordidaria jubata is listed as a state noxious weed. But on the right, we have a very similar looking um, Cordidaria celawana, which is also present in the islands. And it's highly invasive in other parts of the world as well, especially California. I know because of its feathery plumes, it's also pretty popular for uh, decorative plan arrangements, ornamental purposes, as, as Aaron mentioned uh, at the beginning. But unfortunately, at the time of, uh, you know, the last time noxious weeds were listed in the state, it was believed that Cordidaria celawana would not become invasive because it has separate male and female plants that are required to produce seeds. But, you know, we've since learned that it's pretty difficult, even for a trained botanist, to distinguish male from female plants. And it's impossible to tell them apart from seed. Uh, research in California has also shown that of the two, Cordidaria celawana is um, probably the more invasive and detrimental to the natural environment. So in spite of this knowledge, and although it is invasive, it is not currently listed as a state noxious weed. So uh, Cordidaria jubata, noxious, invasive, other one not. And finally, um, so to conclude my portion of my presentation, all, almost all noxious weeds are invasive plants, but the overwhelming majority of actual or potential invasive plants are not regulated as noxious weeds at the state or federal level. And um, that suits some people just fine. So I will uh, pass it along to uh, Jonathan now and uh, he can take it from here. All right, um, good evening, everyone. So um, yeah, so I'll just do a little bit about, um, I think what, you know, the plant quarantine branch does with regards to inspections. Um, you know, Chuck and Stephanie have done a good job of kind of highlighting, I think, some of the, you know, the issues with regards to invasive plants. And, you know, I'll talk specifically, I think, more about what um, we do. So, uh, the, so the first thing is the plant quarantine branch, we, we have quite a broad mandate in terms of what things are actually inspected. So for all intents and purposes, it's agricultural products, plants, plant parts, um, um, so fruit, fruits, vegetables, cut flowers, um, unmanufactured um, wood, logs, um, basically uh, um, plant products in the raw or natural state. Um, we also regulate non-domestic animals and non-cultural microorganisms, but obviously outside the scope of um, what we're talking about today. So these things, um, the requirement statutorily is that they are inspected upon entry into the state. So um, whether that be a container ship, a passenger's baggage, uh, mail, uh, FedEx, UPS, um, DHX, you know, wh whatever it may be, private jet, private boat, um, these things must be declared and they must be inspected prior to entry. So all of the, um, so what, what happens is um, we have inspectors statewide um, who are at the ports of entry conducting inspections. Um, so, you know, 90% of the goods that we um, that this that we use you know are, are imported so you know we have quite a lot of work to do um the higher risk goods that we normally find are obviously through air um 
one of the challenges, you know, again, with regards to inspections is that, you know, everybody is a seller nowadays, you know, with the, you know, with the, um, the onsets of things like Etsy, um, Facebook Marketplace, um, Amazon, everything can be gotten from anywhere the next day. And it's very hard to educate everyone about everybody else's rules. So, you know, there's, for all intents and purposes, a lot of inadvertent smuggling. Um, and then you have, you know, actual smuggling of things. Um, regarding to the regs, um, Stephanie brought up that, um, you know, Chapter 70 does exist. And, you know, um, a lot of our interceptions come through the non-compliance portions of those rules. So orchids, bromeliads, um, grasses, things like that. Uh, so you have you have uh, non-compliance issues um, for you know lack of permits, lack of phytosanitary, san phytosanitary certificates, treatments, things like that. Um, you also do have pest issues. Um, upon entry, inspectors are looking actively for insects, diseases, any type of hitchhiker um, that could be with a shipment. Um, should there be something found, um, the shipments are placed on hold, samples are collected, um, submitted for identification. Um, based on the identification of whatever is collected, um, the plant or the shipment may be destroyed, uh, may be sent out of state, um, or potentially subjected to a treatment um, which would eradicate uh, the organism that was found. So it really depends um, on the situation. Um, for example, you know, you have a container of animal feed that's infested with beetles. The treatment um, is probably far more cost effective than sending it, you know, an entire 40 foot container back. You have one box of flowers for somebody on Valentine's Day, you know, sending that particular parcel back, obviously cheaper than treating it. So it really depends on the situation and the pest. Um, inspections are, are constant you know goods are moving um, on a on a on a daily basis 24 hours a day well, not 24 hours a day but you know most of the time for uh, for example in honolulu um we have inspectors that go to fedex um there are three inspectors that go on a daily basis well, you know, well monday through saturday and um there's basically three belts you have one belt for honolulu proper you have one belt for the rest of Oahu and then one belt for the rest of the state. And you're getting 35 to 40,000 boxes a day. Just That's just mail at FedEx. You, UPS is larger. You have the postal service. Again, you have air cargo, you have baggage. So you, know, you see some photos here of, of, um, of, of inspectors kind of getting their hands dirty. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so uh, I think one of the things with, with inspections is, you know, I mean, you can't see my uniform, the light blue, but um, a lot of people do um, confuse the state um, inspectors with the federal ones. So there is a federal quarantine uh, for fruit flies, which prevents, um, you know, fruit um, going to the mainland. And that's the real reason why, you know, baggage is screened going out, not necessarily coming in. And that's really to, um, for all intents and purposes, to protect the, the mainland from 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 Hawaii. And um, so, and then then you have things about like where customs is, and like Stephanie really really kind of hit the nail on this. You know, the state is preempted really from dealing with regulation in federal commerce. So once things are outside of federal commerce, the state does have the ability to take some action and. Um, our ability to take action is actually broader than the than than the federal folks in terms of we don't necessarily have a list of actionable pests. So um, there are there are opportunities I think there um, to you know to kind of kind of close that particular gap. But um, anyway, just a few minutes about inspections and um, you know I'll be available for some questions I think if if anybody has them. And then um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So we've learned about um, plants that have rules and laws associated with them. So let's talk about invasive plants. Uh, myth, invasive plants are not sold here. So here we have three very common plants that are sold in nurseries and garden centers throughout the state. Um, octopus tree 
asparagus fern and shrubby delinea or simpo. Um, they don't look evil. They look pretty nice. They're just for sale in a garden store, right? Next slide. <laughs> Um, so each of them have scored high risk on the Hawaii invasive species, um, sorry, Hawaii Pacific weed risk assessment. So they're all high risk. So we know that they are um, high risk of becoming invasive, but these plants are all actually invasive. We can see it right before our eyes. So the picture on the left is an octopus tree, and this is kind of a good story, kind of. Well, recently a concerned citizen emailed us so upset that this plant was being sold at a store. So I you know, talked to him and said, I'm so sorry, but Hawaii has really permissive laws when it comes to the sale of invasive plants. And there's not much we can do. Well, he took it a step beyond and actually called that garden store manager and told the manager how invasive it, invasive it is and why they shouldn't be selling it. So that was really good. And it, it takes people like us, like, you know, everyday people to talk to garden centers and nurseries and explain why, why things shouldn't be sold. Um, so we're really thankful for this person. So obviously falsified, invasive plants are sold here every day. So here are three pictures of those plants we just looked at for sale that are actually invading. All of them um, put out these kind of like bright berries that are delicious to birds. So these non-native fruit eating birds are spreading these plants. So we have non-invasive, I'm sorry, we have invasive species spreading invasive seeds. So octopus tree, it's kind of easy to see because it's got those bright red tentacles. Um, you can see that growing on other trees as, as an epiphyte or possibly in gutters. Um, on the bottom, we have asparagus fern. I took this picture and it was far away from any home. So a bird must have brought it and dropped the seed and now it's growing. I mean, that's not just a problem for the forest and natural areas, but for homeowners, it is really hard to get rid of it once it gets um, established. A professional landscaper recently told me that one of her clients asked to um, for, the, for the company to get rid of that plant in her yard. And the, the company laughed because it's going to take so much money. They have to basically evacuate the whole ground, excavate it, and take all of the soil out because it'll grow from every little piece of root, not to mention um, how hard it is to get into it to work with it. So that's a landscaping nightmare. And then we have shrubby delinea, which is growing in parts of Manoa in the lower ridges and valleys um, in Oahu. It's not established on Hawaii Island yet. So in 2017, I did a, a full survey of every nursery I could gain entry into on Hawaii Island. And out of about 50 nurseries, we found that more than 55% were selling one or more invasive plant. And that's about when we started the Plant Pono program which is a program to teach residents um, and community members how to choose non-invasive plants for their, their yards and landscapes. And it's also um, an endorsement program, Kauai and Hawaii Island, we both have it, where we work with nurseries and ones that agree to not sell certain invasive plants, we um, endorse and promote as much as we can. Next slide. So I'm very happy to say that now it's only about 20% of nurseries on Hawaii Island that sell invasive plants. But invasive plants are still sold here. Here we have night blooming jasmine, which is one of the top five invasive plants in my opinion. So on the left, it looks pretty nice, nothing wrong with it. It's for sale at a, a garden store. But the picture in the middle, 
It's what happens after you plant it. And it makes these bright white berries that birds just love. And each one of those berries contains seeds. And it's all a chance for a bird to eat and move into natural areas. So on the right, it's hard to see, but in that red circle, we have a cakey night blooming jasmine. And in the background, we have a young koa grove. So you go down the road just a little bit more and you can see the koa trees are much bigger. The whole understory is all night blooming jasmine, which means when the koa make seeds and drop their seeds, it's out competed by the night blooming jasmine immediately. It cannot, um, it cannot grow because the night blooming jasmine is taking up all the space, all the nutrients, everything. And once these koa reach the end of their life and they die, all we're gonna have is a field of night blooming jasmine. And obviously that is not good for biodiversity, percolating water into the watershed or holding soil intact. Um, so again, myths, uh, invasive species are not sold here. So on the left, we have a pampas grass plume that um, I was alerted that it was for sale at the Kona Home Depot. So I went there as soon as I can, and I talked to the, the manager of the store and told her that it's a noxious weed and she should not be selling it. Thankfully, she listened to me and took the display down right in front of me. So no more at Kona Home Depot, very proud of them. Meanwhile, in the middle, we have some pampas grass growing, and this is or was a bisque eradication target for eradication on Hawaii Island. And we are proud to say that we have eradicated every known population on Hawaii Island. It took many, many years and a lot of outreach, but we did it. But all I can say is every known population, because on the right, this is a seed packet that I was trying to buy when I was preparing this pr presentation, and I can get it at any time. I could get pampas grass. How is the Department of Agriculture gonna like check every little bit of mail? Like Jonathan Ho said, now with Etsy, um, the US mail, it's just so much is coming through and it's impossible to check everything. So in theory, I could get these pampas grass seeds and germinate them and grow them. But also we don't know what variety or what species it is. Is it Cordideria celawana or Jubata? We know they're both invasive, but one is noxious and against the law. So speaking of mislabeled plants, um, Aaron talked about this earlier. Here we have Calea turnifolia otherwise known as Mexican dream herb, which um, is a plant that's widely for sale on the internet. Well, a friend of a friend bought some seeds from the internet and grew that seed and then gave it to a friend I knew. And he said, here, Joe, here's some Mexican dream herb. So Joe took that plant and put it into his yard and, and didn't do much more with it. Next slide. Um, Joe's not the best at landscaping, so he did just leave it in his yard. And like the night blooming jasmine, it covered his yard. Meanwhile, we knew in about 2020 that devil weed was on Hawaii Island. It's a noxious weed, and that was it was in a lot of locations. So we did a huge outreach push and taught people how to identify it. And then I was alerted to come down to Joe's house. Next slide. This plant took over like a quarter of his yard. And thankfully I went down there and I was able to say, Joe, this is actually devil weed. This is a noxious weed. Well, the BIS crew came out the next day and got rid of it. So Joe does not have to worry about it. And thankfully it didn't spread um, into neighboring properties, but it wasn't his fault. Like he was given a plant, he believed his friend and look what happened. They look very similar. It's, you can't really blame anybody. They have a similar habit 
they, they really look the same. Um, the leaves look similar. They've both got the longitudinal um, phaination. The flowers look the same. They have the same growth habit, like I said, but there are some differences like the flower color. So it's kind of easy. The devil weed here on Hawaii Island has um, purple flowers. Um, Mexican dream herb has white or cream flowers. Um, <clears throat> Um, devil weed has more styles and longer styles on the flower, so it has more of a messy hair look, but a really like beside if it's not flowering because things aren't always flowering a really good way if you can go up to the plant is to actually smell it rub the leaf and smell your hand. Um, devil weed smells like turpentine and i've never seen Mexican dreamer, but I um, i've been talking to people that actually grow it. They say the leaf doesn't smell like anything. So we found out it was being sold widely on the internet and I reached out to many, many people that were selling Chromalena odorata and calling it Calea turnifolia. And I just let them know, listen, you've misidentified the plant. This is how you've done it. It's okay. Like, you know, we all make mistakes, but also it's against the law to sell import noxious weeds to Hawaii. And I gave them the laws and it kind of worked because if you can see in the arrows, they say now they're not gonna ship to Hawaii. But if you think that possibly, especially for a plant that you're going to ingest, if you don't know what it is, you should take it down to the Department of Agriculture, your local botanist or invasive species committee and make sure you know what the plant is before you, you know, ingest it. On to Stephanie. Thanks so much, Molly. That was great. Um, I learned a lot. So now that we've busted these myths, what's next? Um, are there any actions going on in the state to um, address invasive species, invasive plants more specifically? There is a big one right now. Um, I talked about chapter 72 and Jonathan talked about chapter 72 of the Hawaii administrative rules, which is the regulates movement within the state. Um, because I have a legal background, all my slides are words. And I thought the most interesting thing was a meeting agenda because this week, the revision of chapter 72 went before the advisory committee um, and they made recommendations and voted to move it on to the Board of Agriculture um, with their recommendations. The current revision of Chapter 72 makes all the plants that are currently on the Hawaii State Noxious Weed List, um, designates them as pests, and allows the Hawaii Department of Agriculture to restrict their um, movement within the state more significantly than just using that list that we have now that says you can't move it to an area that was relatively free of it in 1992. So that's a very, um, it's a it's a big step with respect to pre preventing the movement of species that are designated as noxious weeds in Hawaii. Um, right now, my understanding is that it, it will be heard by the Board of Agriculture at a public meeting on February 28th. That is not set in stone. That is uh, my understanding at this time, but it they will consider it and whether or not to move the modified rules forward. If they vote to do so, it will become a proposed administrative rule. Both the board meeting and proposed administrative rules are available on the board, um, the Hawaii Department of Ag's website. For the Board of Ag, it's a public meeting. People can listen, can submit testimony if they want to, um, if they have any thoughts about the proposal. And then it will be listed as a proposed rule. And then it will go to public hearing um, later this year. Um, so that's one thing that's happening with respect to it. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing that the Hawaii Department of Agriculture is doing is they are considering modifying the re, um, plant import list to add firewood. Again, it doesn't, um, not because firewood obviously is invasive species, it's dead wood, but because it can bring in a variety of invasive pests. 
Um, they've had two scoping meetings um, in 2022 to let industry that sells firewood know that this is something they're considering. Many other states have restrictions with respect to firewood required to be heat treated and properly labeled so that it's not infested with pests when it's brought into the state. But as part of that process, they may look at other rules in Chapter 70 that will be up to them at that time. And with that, I will hand it off. Thank you guys. So we had a lot of information and basically it boils down to as of now, until some of these rules and regulations get changed and updated, which can take some time, um, it's kind of up to us to figure out what we can buy. And it can be anxiety inducing and we feel bad if we choose something that is invasive. So you don't have to stress, there's actually tools that can help us. Um, so you don't know what to buy, to buy or not to buy. It's actually easier than you think. There are a couple of websites that are really gonna help you out. The one easiest one that's really easy to use is plantpono.org. So when you go to this website, you can screenshot it or just type it into your phone and you wanna plant something in your yard but you wanna make sure it's not invasive, you can go to this little bar right here um, and click on find a Pono plant. When you do that, it actually gives you these options to where you can say, um, I'm looking for a shrub and I want something with red or orange flowers um, and I wanna make sure that it's not invasive. You can filter out your searches. I want a tree, I want a vine, I want some ferns, I want ground cover, I want a hedge. There's all of these options for you. You can even get it down to um, how much sun your yard receives. So that's an easy way to just make sure that you're buying something that is not invasive. If you've already bought something and you think it might be invasive, then you can go down to this little box here and you can search the common name or if you know the scientific name. When you do that, uh, it will bring up what you bought. So let's say I purchased some of those Tree of Heaven cuttings and I got it here and I'm listening to this and I think, oh snap, I bought some uh, Tree of Heaven. What is the deal with it? So you type it in and it's gonna give you the risk score. But even beyond that, it can say, go ahead and get rid of it and plant these instead. So it'll give you options. So it's really easy to use and there's a really great interface and I highly recommend that people use this. If you go to Plant Pono and you don't find a plant on there, you can email them and say, can you do a weed risk assessment on whatever the plant is? And it'll take them about a week or a couple of weeks, they get a backlog, but they will go ahead and do that weed risk assessment, which looks at 40 some odd characteristics of how the plant spread, how it grows, what's the invasive risk, and they can get that score for you. So plantpono.org, I highly recommend using it. And then if you are on Oahu, the Board of Water Supply also has a planting guide. Now, Plant Pono gives you options for native species, but also non-invasive species. But if you really want to start um, just a strictly native garden in your area on Oahu, you can go to the Board of Water Supply Conservation Tips website, and you can select what zone you live in, and they will give you a list of nothing but Hawaiian plants. And it will also tell you this is all based on how much water you receive in your area. Another really good guide that you can use statewide is the State Department of Transportation Highways Division. They actually have a planting guide um, that's listed on their website, and that is the Landscape Architecture Program. So this will also give you nothing but native Hawaiian plants, but it tells you on which zone you live in, how much water you receive, what are the best plants, and it has them listed by trees, shrubs, fern, and even grasses. So there are a lot of options out there that can help you so that you don't get overwhelmed and anxious. So um, that myth has been busted. So right now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we will go through the question and answer portion. See that we do have some stuff in the Q and A. Um, Franny asked, how many inspectors does HDOA have currently throughout the state? This is be for Jonathan. And are there many positions still unfilled?
sorry. Oh, um, so the um, so right now um, there there so the plant quarantine branch has a total of, of eighty two people statewide. So that's everybody. That's not necessarily just inspectors. So uh, I think there's seventy one inspectors statewide. Um, what did I write? I was I was counting in my head. Um, seventy one inspectors statewide. The twelve vacancies and um, seven are in active recruitment. We just um, what's today. Yeah, so this week we finished hiring um, um, our seventh new inspector for Oahu. Um, so we we lost quite a few people last year. So um, we got seven we got seven new guys um, in the last three weeks. Um, we're recruiting three more for Oahu, um, two on Maui, two in is it four? No, it's like four on Oahu, two on Maui, and three in on Hawaii Island. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're making headway, kind of going back to like, you know, uh, I guess like pre, um, I guess pre-RIF times or, you know, back, you know, 15 years ago. But, um, you know, um, you know, I think um, as everybody has seen, you know, the, um, there's a lot of things that come in and, you know, you're looking at a small portion of the state budget and um, having, you know, 60 people trying to cover all of this stuff is, is a challenge. So Jonathan, just to follow up to that question, um, I heard somewhere that the state budget that's dedicated to Department of Agriculture is about 0.2%. Is that true? Um, I think the entire department gets, I think, 0.38, I believe, for the general fund. I think it's 0.38, something like that. Um, and um, let's see, I think the department has like 300, well, 340 positions um, total, something like that. So, you know, and then, and you know, obviously plant quarantine is one, you have plant pest control, you have pesticides, you have ag resource management, animal industry. So, you know, there, there's a huge mission and, you know, a very small piece of the pie. I mean, for, I guess, for um, some context, like DLNR gets like 1.1% or so, 1% or something like that. So you, you think of like the two agencies for conservation, like the two major state agencies for conservation and, um, you know, I guess the first line of defense PQ, you're getting what less than one and a half percent of the state budget, and um, yeah. And then just to follow up on that, just for clarification, someone asked: so is that 0.38 percent part of the less than one percent overall that's dedicated to conservation? Uh, so yeah, so the, the 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 general fund budget that's allocated for the entire Department of Agriculture is, I believe, 0.38 percent. Um, and then DLNR gets about like one or 1.1%. .1%. So one and a half percent of the state budget for DLNR and for Department of Ag. And, you know, obviously DLNR is a, a very large agency. You have the land board, you have all these other parks and recreation, things like that. So, you know, you have a whole bunch of other um, functions that are held there. Yeah, yeah small, small, small portion. Um, we have another question. I don't know if this would probably go to Stephanie. What would it take to get rules changed so that Hawaii could export foods such as avocados and prevent invasives or other non-natives from being brought in? So what would it take to get some of those rules changed? Well, I, Jonathan, are avocados prohibited from being exported from Hawaii? Yes and no. It depends on the variety. Um, so, so basically, what it boils down to is um, the, this goes back to the baggage screening when you leave the state. So, there's basically a federal quarantine for fruit flies for Hawaii, um, for all intents and purposes, to protect California. Um, you know, and they're I think what four or five billion dollar ag industry. So, so um, you know, fleshy fruit cannot go to the mainland. Um, I think Sharwell avocados um, are the only ones that can go um, if they're grown in a certain, they have a certain um, growing standards and packing standards that they have to maintain um, and they can ship those. Um, but I believe that's the only variety currently. Um, there are mechanisms to basically petition USDA to basically to conduct a study to be able to show that a particular fruit or variety or cultivar is able to and and your um sorry the cultivar in in addition to your your um 
your mitigation or processing measures to prevent the export or, or uh, of, of federally actionable pesticides fruit flies. So there's a way to do it. Um, it's very complicated and it takes a lot of time. And um, I think the Sharwo one, I, I don't know, it took them years to get it done. And it was only that one variety that they were able to get. So um, so that's the mechanism. And then I think, was the second part was for import or? Yeah, what, what would it take to get the rules changed to prevent invasives? Are there non-natives from being brought in? Uh, so, it, so I guess it, it would depend on the particular species, um, whether it be a plant or an animal. Um, and then, plants. Yeah. So, um, so with regards to plants, um, Stephanie had mentioned like the the um, the restricted plant list. Um, that's probably I think to restrict a plant because it, it the plant in of itself is detrimental. Um, the department has been has kind of dabbled in it, and um, we do actually have some. We worked with was with CGAPS to um, to come up with some draft. Um, like a shell of rules for that. Um, and hopefully we can then implement that. And then once those rules are in place, there, that there is a mechanism to basically try to initiate rule amendments. Um, yeah. To go through the public process. Stephanie, is there anything you want to add to that? I know you're working on this too. Oh, no, that was a, a great answer. Just that, you know, HDOA, has, as Jonathan pointed out, a small budget, a small staff, and a huge mandate. And so, you know, these, a lot of these rules are out of date and they are like getting to them, you know, as they can, you know, right now they're working on chapter 72. It hasn't been updated in like, what was one update like in 2016, but basically 20 years. Um, so it's yeah, okay. uh, I, uh, I think a comprehensive overhaul, um, 30 years. So, I mean, this, these are heavy lifts and the rulemaking process is, is a very long labor intensive process. They have to take one of those, you know, people, 82 people, whatever the number Jonathan said is put them on making a rule. So it's, it is a big lift. And, and when they do it, it is um, good for the public to look at it and provide input. So, but it, but, and then, you know, for other things, what might require actual change at the legislature. So there are a number of steps that would be required. And uh, Stephanie or Jamie or Jonathan, would you guys be able to drop in the chat where people can go to provide that testimony? Excellent, thank you. And I um, appreciate that. Just to back up on the avocados, um, clarification is um, perhaps another way to ask the question is what would it take to get Hawaii grown avocados to be more easily sold in supermarkets here in Hawaii? versus the California avocados. Oh, that, that's a tough one. Um, I think, you know, again, I think one of the biggest challenges um, that uh, the, any agricultural producer has in the state is that they have to pay so much more to get all their resources here to produce their products. Fertilizer, um, um, you know, everything costs more in Hawaii because you have to basically get it on a ship. And, you know, and land is, you know, exorbitantly more expensive. So, you know, they're, they're basically behind the eight ball, you know, um, with regards to anything that's produced. And, you know, and, and it's unfortunate that, you know, the high cost of living, basically, you know, people are like, you know, there's a $5 avocado and a $2 avocado from Mexico they're going to buy the $2 one. And, um, you know, trying, and then Hawaii products really to survive are really becoming, I think, like premium for all intents and purposes, um, just to be able to stay alive. And it's unfortunate in that, that by, by becoming more premium, um, it makes it just much less accessible. And um, without finding ways to, you know, lower shipping costs to make um, things more competitive with the mainland, well, and obviously the cost of land and stuff like that, until those those things can be really leveled, you know, um, local producers are always going to be behind the eight ball. And um, without, you know, having, you know, really concerted um, outreach or, or events that really highlight how much better, like fresh and local grown things are, 
it, it's really hard because a lot of people are like, again, I can buy two avocados for the price of this one. They're not going to take, they're not going to take the jump. And it's trying to find ways to get them to experience those things. And they're like, wow, this is so much better. And, um, and then um, once people experience it, then they're, they're more willing to, you know, splurge and, 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 you know, and, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, buy local. And, you know, um, um, I went to the mainland and um, I was on a farm tour and we went to basically an apple orchard and, you, you know, in Hawaii, we, we only have certain kinds of apples and you go over there and you're like, what is this? Like all these things that you've never experienced then. And then you tell them you should come to Hawaii and try mangoes or avocados. And they're like, they're like, what? Really? And, and you're like, you have no idea what you're missing, you know? And it's, it's kind of that same thing. It's how do you, and so it's, how do you get that out to, 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 to the people that um, are here? And it, it's, it's really tough, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, we do grow some of the best, best products here. Um, and just, we're running out of time, but somebody did have a question about, do kids learn about native plants in schools in Hawaii? This is public schools, sort of outside charter schools. And I'll just go ahead and take this one since Jamie and I work in outreach for um, OS on Oahu. Each of the invasive species committees has an outreach team. And this is one of our um, main missions is to go to K through 12 schools and talk about impacts of invasive species and what native species are. And a lot of these public schools do have um, sort of a farm to school program where not only they learn about agricultural crops, but they do incorporate native species information too. Um, I can say on Oahu, it's a little bit more challenging because it's harder for us to see native species just in our environment versus you know somewhere like uh, Big Island where you have ohia everywhere. So um, yeah, if you can share it with your kids and your family about native species, that's wonderful to do too. Um, Jamie, I can only send the links to the panelists. So I sent the links to you. If, if you could post them to everyone, that would be great. Well, good. So I appreciate everybody for coming out tonight. Special thank you to our panelists. And we really appreciate um, you guys sharing your expertise and your information about this. What we will do is um, any questions that went unanswered, we will send it to you via email um, so that you guys have an idea about what was asked and what was answered. If you have any further questions, um, you're more than welcome to reach out to your local invasive species committee. And just as a reminder, if you liked this presentation, um, you might wanna join us for some upcoming High Sam webinars. Tomorrow night, they're gonna be talking about biocontrol and why we need it. What was the mongoose? Why does everybody talk about the mongoose in relation to biocontrol? Hint, it's not biocontrol. So they'll talk about that story. And then a little bit later on, on February 28th, the really fun presentation with Chuck is going to be, what in the bleep is this plant? So we learned about what bad plants are. So he's going to kind of go through some of those. Uh, what the heck is it that's in my backyard? Molly's part of that too. And Molly will be there too. <laughs> wonderful. They both have wonderful stories. Um, so join in for those. For a full High Sam um, schedule, you can go to the website there that you see listed at the bottom. So mahalo to everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Stay dry. Thank you. Aloha. Have a good night. Everyone, thanks. Thank you.